I'm Christian Chiller. Welcome to my podcast, an enthusiastic ramble through whatever has taken my interest the past week or so. Expect technology, games, history, travel, geekery, and as always, much, much more. Welcome to Chinchilla Squeaks with me, Chris Chinchilla, recording this intro from a hotel room in Bilbao at the Open Source Summit, organized by the Linux Foundation. Lots of interviews in progress that will be coming out of that over the coming episodes. But uh, this episode, I just wanted to sneak in uh, something from my backlog of interviews, because I've got quite a few, actually. So no links this time. I'm actually just going to get right into the interview and then come back with a little bit of an update from me at the end of it. This is my interview with Molham RF from Relational AI. Quite a technical but interesting project and startup that any of you doing uh, heavy AI and data work with Snowflake will find very interesting. Enjoy. Uh, how are you doing, Molham? I'm doing all right, Chris. How are you? Good. I always think running these late night calls... I'm far more awake than I am. And then I start talking and I realize I really am not. <laughs> Especially when we have in your headline, the AI co-processor for your cloud data. That's a lot of complex terms I need to unpack at 11 p.m. Well, um, I'd love so, to help you unpack them. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about relational AI and what an AI co-processor is. Okay, I'd be happy to. So uh, Relational AI is a Silicon Valley-based company. It's got about uh, 200 people, mm -hmm. um, a lot of engineers. We have uh, about 150 engineers, uh, 40 are field engineers, and 110 are product engineers. And um, we're working on sort of very new kind of um, database uh, slash AI technology, right? So so we're, our work is at the intersection of databases and, and AI. And... Um, the way we define AI uh, is to think of it sort of more holistically than just language models or even just uh, deep learning or machine machine learning. We think uh, of AI as also including uh, graph technology, graph uh -huh. analytics, uh, prescriptive analytics, um, things that involve optimizers and solvers for doing things like linear programming, integer programming, quadratic programming, uh, rule-based reasoning engines to express different types of um, um, business logic and to model, to allow you to model your business. Simulation, uh, in the 30 years I've been um, building intelligent applications in the enterprise, we've typically needed a combination of these things um, to develop these uh, smart, high value uh, applications uh, that people want. So that's what we mean by AI. By coprocessor, we mean something that plugs into your data cloud. Um, we are very happy to have announced in uh, in July, our partnership with Snowflake. So Snowflake has uh, created that category and is leading that category. And so if you have a, if you're a Snowflake customer that wants to do graphs or rules or prescriptive analytics or certain types of predictive analytics, you typically have to move all your data out of Snowflake and, and, and use some technology that isn't, um, uh, you know, um, designed to work with Snowflake. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that means you leave the security perimeter, you give up the, uh, um, governance uh, infrastructure that you've worked hard to implement in Snowflake. Uh, that means typically that you're working with cloud hosted instead of cloud native solutions like Snowflake. So you don't get versioning, time travel, zero copy cloning. You don't get consumption pricing. You don't get effectively infinite storage and compute. Uh, so all that stuff uh, you give up. And then finally, um, you have to typically use non-relational technology that's at the paradigm level incompatible with uh, Snowflake, which is, you know, a relational uh, technology at its foundation. And so we find that um, there's a lot of cost and friction and headaches and fragility that comes from uh, having to do that, that we take off the table because we're embedded into Snowflake. We run uh, inside of Snowflake as a, a part of a Snowpark container service. Mm -hmm. So we pick up all the governance. Uh, we're cloud native like Snowflake. So we have all of the features and consumption pricing and we're relational like Snowflake. So you don't have any friction at the paradigm level. I hope that made some sense. It does. Let's very quickly, for those who are not familiar, in a in very brief, because it's not really about them, what is Snowflake? 
Uh, I think I've had a few related um, products and companies over the past couple of years talking about it, but let's just very quickly yeah. recap what it is. Yeah, so for me, uh, Snowflake is an amazing piece of technology uh, uh, because it's for the first time um, Snowflake figured out how to create a database that can not only hold all of the data for one enterprise, it can hold all the data for all enterprises. It's a supremely scalable database, relational database, SQL database that was designed to handle big data. Uh, when people thought that there's no way to make relational databases uh, support that workload, right? Remember 10 years ago, if you wanted to do big data, you had to go to Hadoop and that was going to be the future of uh, data management, right? Now, today, Hadoop is like COBOL. It's uh, basically relevant. So Snowflake solved a major problem with uh, OLAP databases, uh, relational databases, in that um, it it has this new kind of cloud-native architecture that makes it uh, effectively, infinitely scalable. Yeah, actually, that came up at a, a KubeCon talk. Uh, I was talking to George? someone who's more of a competitor to, to um, Snowflake than you, ah. and they mentioned Hadoop. And it's like I haven't heard anyone mention that in a long time. That <laughs> 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 it was ah. so popular a few years ago. Yeah, just a few it's years so, ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. one of our. Um, Major uh, individual supporter that sits on our board, major investor, is Bob Muglia, who was the CEO of Snowflake from 2014 to 2019. And he tells this funny story where two or three years before Snowflake had the largest and most successful software IPO of all time, he was turned down for funding uh, 24 times, 25 times, something like that. Uh, because people thought that the future was Hadoop and uh, and, and, and systems like that. So um, really, you have to understand databases in a fundamental way to appreciate how a novel architecture mm. uh, can give you an advantage. And in our case, and, and, and that same architecture, but also combined with new kinds of joint algorithms and semantic query technology and JIT compilation and incremental computation and uh, relational language extensions that make it possible to support workloads that people didn't dream you could support mm. in the relational paradigm. Mm. Yeah, that's... Uh, I think it's the relational part. That's, it's, it's also to get to this point, we came down the sort of NoSQL journey because that was the paradigm that people thought would be the only one that scaled. Exactly, um, exactly. And that wasn't that long ago either. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, there's a really interesting backstory to this, right? So mm-hmm. the relational model is always laughed at uh, yeah. for like a new interesting uh, workload. It's laughed at as typically non-scalable, non-performant, and uh, hard to understand, right? Mm-hmm. This was uh, th- these debates happened in the seventies and early eighties around the OLTP workload, the transaction processing workload. Like real engineers laughed at the relational model because real engineers use Codaso uh, uh, database technology for transactions, you know. Uh, uh, but we invented SQL and we invented B-trees and we invented uh, Volcano-style query processing and rule-based optimizers. And by the time the mid eighties rolled around. It was like the only uh, way to do to build uh, transactional apps was with uh, SQL and relational technology. Yeah. Same in the '90s for OLAP. I don't know if you remember OLAP and MOLAP and ROLAP. Uh, you know, again for analytics for for analytical processing, people thought relational technology was going to be a joke yeah. uh, because if you want performance, you have to do it with arrays or what we call tensors today. And we invented parallel join algorithms and bitmap indices and column stores and vectorized query processing. And boom, no one talks about MOLAP anymore. It's only it's only OLAP because the only kind of OLAP you get is ROLAP. And then, of course, we just mentioned 10 years ago with big data workloads and Hadoop was going to be the future. And again, uh, that wasn't the case. And so there there are uh, the nice thing about the model is separates the what from the how. The, the representation is independent from the implementation. And so you have flexibility in picking new architectures and picking new um, joint algorithms and data structures that work really well. Um, for the new workload. And of course, if you can automate away all that programming uh, and make things declarative, uh, inevitably it will win because who wants to do the all the work to do this, the out-of-core memory management and the parallelization and and the, the, the concurrency control and all that kind of stuff. Like if we can avoid doing it at the application level, of course yeah. we would avoid doing it. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's go back to, to relational 
AI. I was going to say relational because it just sounds a bit odd. But yeah. um, when you say co-processor, I think sort of two things come to mind and I'd like to dig into a little bit about what exactly you're providing. So when I hear co-processor, I'm thinking something physical, but I'm assuming it probably isn't uh, or is no, it a bit this, of a combination of, by, uh, of hardware and this, software? Yeah, sorry. So uh, we really um, um, thought hard about this because mm. we knew that when we say coprocessor, most, pe- some, most people's minds would go towards hardware. Okay. Yeah. But this is really an analogy, you know, in, uh, I don't know how far back you go in computing, but in, uh, in the early days, you know, you had the 8088 chip and it wasn't very good at floating point math. And so mm-hmm. the 8087 yeah. was the coprocessor to make it uh, do well. So that's obviously an example of a, of a hardware coprocessor. Yeah. Of course, today we know all about GPUs. Yeah. And so GPUs sit on the same motherboard as your CPU and they don't get used for most things. Like they don't get used for word processing or email or spreadsheeting. But when you need to do graphics or gaming or machine learning or crypto mining, they're essential. Okay, mm. and the CPU knows how to offload the work onto uh, um, the GPU. So the, by analogy, we're doing the same thing. Like relational systems, like Snowflake, are amazing at OLAP and certain types of uh, transaction processing, and they can do JSON analytics and, and 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 so on. But they themselves will tell you if you need uh, graphs, we're not your choice. If you want mm. rules, that's not us. If you want prescriptive analytics, that's not us. So they leave you with this. Uh, historically, they would you would have to leave that system, okay? But uh, but now that they you know and, you know their Snowflake is working on becoming the data cloud, and so mm-hmm. being a platform for all application development, they've created points of extensibility that let you plug us in as a relational engine that can do these things that uh, it doesn't support. And so they win because now on their platform you can do this stuff. Like Intel wins when, you know, on their platform, you can do graphics and gaming and machine learning. Uh, and of course, uh, the customer wins because, you know, most of them have spent the last two or three years moving all their data onto Snowflake. And so the last thing they want to do is immediately move it mm-hmm. off uh, to build intelligence into, into their applications. And so it's um, wins for the customer, wins for Snowflake. Of course, it's a win for relational AI. Uh, and, you know, we, we want to be like the software equivalent of NVIDIA uh, yes. for the software equivalent of Intel or the database equivalent, I should say, uh, for both. So. Okay. And how, how, how did you get here? What, what, were you, what made you or whoever else it was that founded the company want to do that? What gap, what pain point were you trying to find? Yeah, fill? well, this goes back to the early 90s for me. So actually, this goes back when I, to, I was, when I was uh, studying uh, to be a computer scientist and a computer engineer. To be honest, my least favorite topic uh, at the time when I was a student was databases. I mean, I thought, ah, database is boring. Uh, but uh, my real interest was machine learning and AI. And I started working in, um, in, in the early 90s on um uh, early versions of neural networks, okay, doing solving problems like credit card fraud detection and supply chain uh, forecasting and so on. And what you realize immediately when you start doing machine learning is getting the data right is super important. It's all about data and, and giving the machine learning uh, algorithm examples of what happened in the past that it can it can generalize from. And so data management is fundamental uh, to the learning part. It's also fundamental after you've created a model, like let's say you created a model that detects credit card fraud, you wanna deploy that model. And so you need a whole bunch of machinery like for workflow and so on, so that when the model scores a transaction as being you know, a 95 of 100 likely percent, you know, 95% likely to be fraud, what do you do with that? Do you stop the transaction always? Do you always let it go? Or maybe you say, well, for really important customers of mine, I'm going to let it go because I don't want to embarrass them at the restaurant. Uh, but for really like, you know, customers that don't matter to me and are not profitable, I'm going to be very conservative. I'm going to stop it right away and they'll have mm-hmm. to prove that it's really them. And so you get into a whole bunch of other considerations, other decisions you have to make that might not be solved with a statistical machine learning model that might need a solver or might need some kind of rule workflow thing or might need, uh, you know, simulation. These things are all work together uh, to create the model and to deploy the model. So I had to learn data management. And then you quickly realize when you're doing data management, 
uh, for AI that there is no data management for AI. It's mm. data management for OLTP or for OLAP or for big data, but not really for uh, these other important workloads. So we we basically, through uh, several uh, iterations, um, you know, invented the technology that we're uh, we're commercializing at Relational AI. Can I just clarify what you mean by data management? Because um, I have interviewed a couple of companies that do what they also claim to be some form of management for uh, ML and AI pipelines. But maybe yeah. you mean something slightly different when you say data management. Yeah. Well, I, I mean like databases. I mean like in the Snowflake sense or, or okay. their predecessors, like, right? So, so I mean like database management. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it, yeah, I mean, if we didn't have good databases that recorded everything, we wouldn't be able to do machine learning, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And in most databases, we tend to have some kind of schema or, or model of the underlying business. And, and those databases have made it possible for us to collect the data so that we can do machine learning. Now, yeah. interestingly, the machine learning uh, sort of world doesn't know anything about databases. You just expect all the data show up in, in, in a data frame or, yeah. you know, like one big wide table. Uh, and they don't understand that that in its in the enterprise that data is not actually stored that way. It's stored in a normalized way in a database. Okay, mm. so you 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 spend a lot of time and energy creating a data model that you uh, that allows you to get the data. And then the first thing that you do when you want to do machine learning is you spend a lot of time and energy flattening all that data out into a data frame so you can feed it to your favorite machine learning tool. And then that machine learning tool spends a lot of time and energy trying to reconstruct the knowledge, the background knowledge that it had. Uh, you know, about uh, the data, you know, uh, through sort of the domain the model or the, the schema, right? So there's, there's just these two worlds don't talk. And there's so much opportunity to uh, streamline things and uh, make things um, easier if, if the, the, you have technology that can sort of do uh, walk and chew gum, that can sort of understand data management and database uh, uh, ideas with uh, machine learning and a AI ideas in general. Okay. Now, what does the the workflow for someone using relational AI look like? Um, sort of browsing your your docs, I can see mentions of uh, RKGS, um, yeah. RHEL. Um, talk me through the steps that someone wanting to use the service would actually go through to accomplish something um, from, a, from a, a Snowflake data source? Yeah, so we've worked very hard uh, with Snowflake uh, to try to, again, minimize friction here uh, for a, a user. So let's say you're, you're um, using graph technology to build features to do a better job of detecting fraud or money laundering or... Uh, you know, you want to have a customer 360, uh, you know, view, uh, you know, and so on. Um, or you're using graphs for supply chain management or whatever. OK, so the the historically what you'd have had to do is, again, through ETL or some other process, copy all the data out of Snowflake, put it and then uh, organize it in a way where you can load it into a graph database. And uh, you would have had to manage the synchronization between those two things. And you would have had to learn a new query language uh, for the graph database that isn't uh, necessarily as familiar to you as SQL and some of the relational technologies. So with us, we think of a knowledge graph as really being a highly normalized relational database, something called graph, graph normal form, okay, mm -hmm. which is very similar to six normal form, which historically has been like interesting curiosity, but not not practical to use. Okay. So we, we create, um, you give us, you know, we, you plug us into Snowflake, uh, and we create, we create a relational knowledge graph as a set of materialized views on the data in Snowflake, on the tables in Snowflake. So, uh, in the, in the best case, right, let's say you just want, you know, the capabilities we provide out of the box, you point us at your data, you create the mappings to the relational knowledge graph, very simple, very straightforward. And uh, we that 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 relational knowledge graph is a set of materialized views on these tables. Meaning, if you add a record or remove a record from a table, it's automatically mapped and synchronized with the graph. And um, a library of graph routines are available to you via SQL or via Python in Snowflake. And then you just uh, you know use SQL to uh, evaluate uh, page rank or between the centrality or you know path counting or whatever it is that you want. And you, your data, from your perspective, your data is in SQL tables. You run us 
like a, like you would run a stored procedure uh, or a UDF, and then you see the results back in a SQL table. So you haven't had to learn a special query language or uh, worry about synchronizing the data or anything like that, okay? Now, at some point, you might want more than what we built in in terms of our basic uh, graph libraries or our graph library. And so if you want to do more than that, then we make uh, available to you a stored relational language, not a stored procedural okay. language, that lets you write rules, you know, uh, you know, A equals B plus C if you want, or, uh, you know, a, a, you know, I want, uh, you know, all uh, uh, paths of length five, you know, by joining together an edge relation, you know, five times. And uh, uh, you can you can sort of build on top of the built in capabilities. OK, but you you can get a lot of value uh, without having to know anything other than SQL. And this is the, the REL. Um, yes, and REL is the stored relational language that you would use, and yeah. that's what's on our uh, on our website. Because yeah. if you need access to that information, you have to come to our website. Okay. Uh, perhaps it sends the long, a wrong message. Perhaps it sends a message that you have to learn that to be uh, to be able to do useful work. But but um, we'll we're you know we'll update our website. Maybe with, it's yeah, hard to we'll, say. I mean, would most people? Do you think most people would discover you through you or through? Snowflake, and then that probably is the onboarding from where most of your customers are coming from, I guess. Or? Yeah, I think from Snowflake. Like we went yeah. to Summit, we made that announcement. We were highlighted in the keynote at the very end. They showed like a 15 second live demo of our system. And I was, it was amazing the response. Mm -hmm. So many people who are looking at graphs that have been thinking about it as, oh man, in order to do this, I have to you know, use a uh, non-embedded, non-cloud-native, uh, non-relational solution that I, I can't pay for on a consumption basis. I have to pre-allocate hardware. I have to do all this stuff. And all of a sudden, we're just saying, hey, it's just a stored relational. It's just a SQL call or a stored relational query uh, inside your system. Mm. I mean, we left that conference with, you know, over 100 leads. And uh, we've already started POCs with several of them. Uh, and the general reaction is, you know, I love it. Uh, it sounds too good to be true. Uh, and I love to hear it sounds too good to be true because I know it's true. And so if we can demonstrate that, then we're we're all set. So, yeah. But just, just one question. Do you have any concerns about having, you know, your business being based off the back of someone else's? Um, do you have any plans to integrate with other at least vaguely comparable uh, platforms or, you know, exist in isolation somehow or some way of having a backup plan just in case? <laughs> no, uh, fair question. I get that from a variety of folks, our investors yeah. and our colleagues. Uh, but um, so, uh, look, you know, did NVIDIA have any concerns about driving most of its business from Intel-based uh, hardware? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, 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 in the end, that was certainly a very smart move. And uh, at different points in time, Intel was worth more than NVIDIA and NVIDIA worth more than Intel. I think they've demonstrated uh, how the coprocessor model can be very, very effective uh, for both the processor and the coprocessor. Like Intel might not be as dominant if it didn't have the 8087 initially and it didn't have GPUs at some point. Uh, so the flip side of that is NVIDIA does work with ARM and AMD and so on. And so whereas I expect Snowflake to be the dominant provider, the category leader in, in the, the data cloud uh, world, I do expect there will be a number two and a number three and a number four. And uh, there's nothing architecturally or from a business model perspective that stops us from working with the um, AMDs of the world and the arms of the world, if you know what I mean, right? The, 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 just in case Snowflakes becomes the next Hadoop. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, I, uh, I, got, uh, I don't think that's likely to happen anytime soon. No, and, no, 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 for uh, sure. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, just even if they don't, like Intel is still the leader in, in CPUs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just people get used to having a coprocessor. And if you have a unique uh, data management technology, you might still want us as a coprocessor to that. Yeah. Okay. And um, I mean, I get the impression from the announcements that the the company, at least publicly, is fairly new. I think uh, we're about five years old. 
So, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so but the research, the research that was done on the, on the algorithms, the underlying technology goes back uh, over 10 years and spans yeah, about yeah, 20 yeah. different universities. Yeah. You know, it's just because uh, you, you have the, the main announcement about introducing the industry's first AI coprocessor. That was relatively recent. Um, yes. So before that, were you fitting in in a, in a different way or that was just kind of more of a consolidation of kind of we, coming out into the, the wild, I guess? Well, so we, we, we have a, a handful of uh, very large clients that have been using us. We've been in production for two or three years, okay. working in partnership with, you know, they were quoted in our press release, uh, yeah. you know, at and and yeah. and other large yeah. Yeah. Uh, company. So that's been very good for us. When we started working with them, we were kind of independent of any data management technology because we were just trying to validate that the technology works and scales and all of that. Okay. However, as, as you probably know, AT&T is a huge Snowflake customer. So they're very, very excited about us being a co-processor there because uh, we take out, you know, a whole bunch of integration uh, yeah. Uh, headaches. So, so we we focused on the engineering uh, first and making sure that the product scales and performs and is as usable as it should be. And then we started experimenting with different um, go to market motions. And this sort of partner led motion with Snowflake as our first and most important partner is very very uh, proven to be very effective. And mm -hmm. so. That was sort of the second half of building our company is uh, yeah. okay. deciding on the go-to-market motion. Okay. So my main reason for asking that, just to clarify, was so that's kind of the most recent announcements. What's what's next? Next six months, 12 months, what's on the roadmap? Next six months, we are going to be laser focused on Snowflake. We're going to make sure that... You know, if I, I said we, we we left the conference with 100 plus leads. Snowflake has 8,100 customers. I bet you the great majority of them uh, want graphs and rules and predictive mm. and prescriptive analytics. And so uh, there is so much to do to to make sure those clients and those prospects are delighted with uh, with the pairing. So I don't anticipate any major announcements uh, mm. in the next six to 12 months other than announcements of customers being happy with our combined solution. Yeah. It's also interesting to you. Eighty one hundred is is high, but not crazy high. So there's also crazy, no. a lot more potential in the future as well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And so this is this is as of the last quarterly earnings report for Snowflake, but they keep adding, right? Mm. So if we talk again in a few months, I'm sure it will be substantially higher than eighty one hundred, and it keeps growing. So we're we're chasing their growth in a sense. So. Okay. And um, just out of pure interest. I notice you do have uh, some something of a, a GitHub presence. So, how much of what you have is um, open versus proprietary? Is it just SDKs and things like that? So the SDKs are definitely open. Yeah. Uh, some of the okay. components that we build, like the basic building blocks, uh, are put out in the open source okay. um, community. Oh yeah, the, uh, the engine, we're, we're, yeah. Yeah, we're going to also um, open source the language. So, oh, okay. so RHEL, we're working on um, defining a semantics for it and uh, providing a, a reference implementation for people who want to use it as a sort of relational uh, engine in or sort of relational language, I should say, in other contexts. Uh, again, a lot of our work is done in collaboration with some of the best, best universities on the planet, and we work with. Uh, the professors and the PhD students, and it's important for publishing that we do work in the open. And so we have yeah. dozens of papers that describe various aspects of the system uh, also out there as well. So, And um, if, if anyone's interested in what we've been talking about, is relational AI kind of a self-serve? Can people test it or is it still very much at that stage of they have to come and talk to you and do PSCs? Not yet, not yet. Yeah. We announced private preview uh, uh, at Summit uh, a month ago. And so that means between us and Snowflake, we have some work to do to get to public yeah. preview. When we get to t public preview uh, late this year, or early next year, uh, it will be much more self-serve. Uh, but if you're curious and you, and you want to know, please email me or please just, uh, okay. they're on our website. There are places you can just email and register your interest. And uh, we'd love to get uh, user feedback uh, early and often. So, And that was my interview with Molham Arif. So a couple of things from me that I've released over the past week, because it has only been a week between episodes. I added a video, a hands-on video about how I digitized some uh, PDF sheet music using a couple of tools, 
which um, was at least interesting and useful to me, even if nobody else, that's over on YouTube. And also there is now uh, video versions. I can't even remember if I've actually uh, mentioned these before or not, but other videos are quickly configuring macOS displays with Display Placer, quite a cool little open source tool. And my video of the future of documentation being dynamic. On that, uh, there's also now a blog post version of that um, that post, which is uh, over on Medium. Link in the show notes. And I, I think that's it. I have a blog version of the Display Placer video uh, very nearly done, but I'll probably release that next week, to be honest with you. And as mentioned last week as well, I have a collection of Flash Fiction out. If you go to Drive Through Fiction or Amazon, you can find print and uh, EPUB versions, and also on Drive Through, an ebook version or of a small gregarious fiction volume one. That is it. And my overhauled website with new branding and things is very nearly there. I'm having to migrate a lot of the images, which is a bit time consuming. Uh, but it's getting there. I may uh, soft release some of that quite soon. There's also no dark mode. I'm sorry. That will that will come soon as well. I'm also going to be overhauling the podcast pages very soon with at least transcripts and summaries of each episode. I'm just trying to figure out the best combination of SaaS or local tools to do that for me. And then maybe coming soon after that will be some kind of interactive player. So you can actually jump between the, the transcripts on the episode. And equally, I am about to also overhaul all my YouTube thumbnails, but again, figuring out the best options, and they will all be blogged about, of course, when I have finally figured it out. All of that can be found on the aforementioned website that is undergoing all of this uh, overhaul. That is chrischinchilla.com, where you can also find ways to support me if you enjoy what I do. But until next time, which will probably be next week as well, with another interview from the backlog, I have been Chris Chinchilla. Thank you very much for joining me and take care, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the show. Find out more about me at chrischinchilla.com, where you can find show notes, sign up for my newsletter, and find all of my writing, games, work, and video links. There's also details on how to get in touch with me. And if you want to get even closer to what I do, join my Discord server for behind-the-scenes discussions and helping me produce my shows and work.